going to introduce Bob Reese. He has been around for a while. We are very excited to have him speak today. Um, but yeah, for those coming in, if you can come up to the front so that we can be as close and involved as possible. Bob. Yes, he has been around a while, <clears throat> maybe too long. We'll see. Uh, I know that the scriptures say that uh, you shouldn't take the upper seats at the feast, but today we will suggest you violate that and move closer, because I feel like there's this great chasm that separates me from you, and I'm, I would normally, as a teacher, come down among you, but uh, since this will only stretch a few feet, we're, uh, we're stuck with this. When I started teaching in the former Soviet Union, I found that all of my students were afraid because they had lived under the Soviet system to ever venture a, an opinion or to give a private uh, um, expression. And I found the only way I could get them to do it was to walk right down in front of them and ask them a question and speak to them. I can't do that to you because of the, <laughs> it's so interesting. We're talking about technology. <laughs> I feel like we're in about 1850 with the system that, that we've got. Anyway, thank you very much for being here. This, uh, uh, you know, it, my, my children and my grandchildren would be laughing that I am talking about technology uh, because they are, uh, they, they kid me unmercifully about uh, how little I know. Anyway, I do know a few things about some things related to technology, and so therefore this, uh, this session. Beginning with the development of primitive tools, humans have wrestled with the question as to whether technology represents peril or progress. The same tool that Cain used to kill an animal for food or thwart a threatening beast he used to kill his brother Abel. In his poem, The Fury of Aerial Bombardment, written during the Second World War, the poet Richard Eberhardt writes, you would feel that after so many centuries, God would give man to repent, yet he can kill as Cain could, but with multitudinous will, no further advanced than in his ancient furies. Our highly developed arsenal of military weaponry currently employed in the Middle East confirms Eberhardt's judgment. Reading the morning news, one has to agree that we can and do kill as Cain could but in much larger numbers and with much greater efficiency and through more technolo technologically advanced. And though more technologically advanced, we are no further morally advanced than in our ancient furies. Similarly, the same technologies that allow general conference to be broadcast live around the world in over 100 languages also makes possible the multi-billion dollar industry of pornography and drugs addiction, as well as many other activities that undermine society and destroy human lives. Computer data storage systems that greatly enhance ancestral research and genealogical work are also employed in fraudulent and deceptive criminal schemes that rob the poor as well as the nation's coffers. The same iPads that missionaries now use to teach the gospel can lead to inefficient and inappropriate use including by missionaries, including accessing sites that can be counterproductive and even spiritually dangerous. Some missionaries have been sent home for spending time on the wrong sites. It is worth noting that along with their iPads, missionaries are given a booklet, quote, Standards for Using Technology and Missionary Work in the Digital Age, something that the first missionaries who went out with their copies of the Book of Mormon didn't have to deal with. And the same smartphones allow for the reading of scriptures in sacrament meeting, also allow the same people sitting in sacrament meeting to watch videos on YouTube, movies, or a million other visuals during that sacred hour. I've been, I was thinking about this not too long ago, sitting in sacrament meeting with everybody out with their iPads and their iPhones and wondering if the bishop had some kind of a technology in front of him, you could say, who's really reading the scriptures and who's looking at other things? It might be interesting. Anyway. From the beginning, the LDS, Church, the LDS Church has used technology to advance its interests. 
a 2007 article on LDS in the LDS newsroom titled, Technology Used by Church in Early Years, states that, quote, in 1867, the church in, in, had an installation of a 500-mile telegraph line connecting outlying settlements to the hub of the church in Salt Lake City, and then to 1996, when the church entered officially the World Wide Web, the church has historically implemented communications technologies in a timely way. Quickly taking advantage of the telegraph in 1867, the telephone in 1876, radio in 1922, television in 1948, the, church, the church's use of technology has significantly expanded with the development of computers, digital technology, satellites, and other inventions. According to the article, quote, for a number of years, the computer services department of the church, this is something I didn't know until I read it, ran a three-shift, 24-hour, six-day-a-week schedule to manage the workload generated by the exciting new technologies. In 1974, Spencer W. Kimball said, I believe that the Lord is anxious to put into our hands inventions of which we laymen have hardly a glimpse. When we have used the satellite and related discoveries to their greatest potential, then, and not until then, shall we approach the insistence of our Lord and Master to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In a 2014 BYU Education Week address, David A. Bednar spoke of the wonders and blessings of modern technology, which he also saw as a direct blessing from heaven. We are blessed to live, learn, and serve in the most remarkable dispensation. An important aspect of the fullness that is available to us is a miraculous progression of innovations and innovations that enabled and accelerated the work of salvation. An almost endless list of technologies and tools that bless our lives. And there are a million people down in Silicon Valley currently at work on a million more. All of these advancements are part of the Lord's face hastening his work in the latter days. It is no coincidence, said Elder Bednar, that these powerful communication innovations and inventions are occurring in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Social media channels are global tools that can personally and positively impact large numbers of individuals and families, and I believe the time has come for us as disciples of Christ to use these inspired tools appropriately and more effectively. Like many modern organizations, the church currently uses technology in a number of positive, constructive, and expansive ways, especially in terms of information and communication. Unlike churches like the Shakers and the Mennonites that eschew modern improvements for simpler, less technologically oriented lifestyles, the Mormon church retains a cadre of highly trained specialists and technicians who employ technology in both ordinary and in creative ways to serve the church's fourfold mission. For example, the church has developed the most comprehensive and sophisticated genealogical research and storage system in the world. With the advent of personal computers and the internet, this system, which has its own website, familysearch.org, is available in homes, libraries, and chapels to millions of people throughout the world. An article in the LDS Examiner this week titled, Mormon Church Uses Technology to Reach Youth Around the World, Kelly Foss reports, quote, partly because of the centralized structure of the Mormon church, it has been an early and effective adapter of technology in fulfilling its mission. This is especially true of the youth of the church. The worldwide faith has members in over 150 nations and leverages technology to stay connected with even small church branches in faraway nations across the globe. An article in the Charlotte Technology Examiner titled, the eldest church's Mormon message. In this, Brent Jackson observes, quote, in the last few years, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has made quantum leaps in the use of technology in communicating to its members and to the world, causing many churches to look on with Mormon envy. Even the Roman Catholic Church, with over a billion members worldwide, doesn't compete with the exposure and efficiency in communicating the LDA communication the LDS Church is reaching. More than most churches, the LDS Church has caught the vision of utilizing technology to accomplish its goals. Jackson notes, especially the church and church-affiliated groups and individuals 
have created sophisticated sites which get priority ranking on Google searches. Quote, today, if you Google the words to Mormon, Joseph Smith, and Latter-day Saints, you will see that the majority of page one results are some of the most well-done sites on the internet, done by the LDS Church or its members. They even dominate the most widely used name in all of Christianity, Jesus Christ. 20 minutes? This has 40, right? Jackson, noting the church's sophisticated use of broadcast website casts and mobile devices, including apps, concludes, clearly the LDS Church is laser-focused on communication with its borders to, uh, and the world, and clearly it's working with the appearance blitz from seemingly every direction. You would have to live in a cave not to be exposed to information about this church. As smartly and as successfully as the church is using technology, and as hopeful as it is in spreading the gospel and managing the myriad activities that take place within the church and through the church, the church is increasingly cognizant of the perils and potential misuses of technology. In an April 2008 General Conference address, President Uchtdorf spoke of the advantages of modern technology, but warned, be cautious. These same technologies can allow evil influences to cross the threshold of your homes. These dangerous traps are only a mouse click away. Pornography, violence, intolerance, and ungodliness destroys families, marriages, and individual lives. These dangers are distributed through many media, through magazines, books, television, movies, etc. In a general conference address entitled Let Our Voices Be Heard, Elder, Bednar, uh, Elder Ballard said that the addition to avoiding negative influence, Latter-day Saints should be active in opposing them. The question under consideration here is the extent to which technology enhances or imperils our lives and advances or retards the ultimate flowering of the kingdom of God. Take climate change, for example. Many moderns, some Mormon, like many moderns, some Mormons, Mormons believe that whatever mess we make of the world, eventually Christ will come and clean it up. Our refusal to acknowledge and take responsibility for the devastation to nature and the environment much of it's caused by modern technology, will have a dramatic effect on the church's ultimate mission. The church is our inheritance and we are its stewards. For this reason, I believe that the 10th article of faith should be changed from its current passive, the earth will be renewed to receive its paradisiacal glory, to we will renew the earth to receive its paradisiacal glory. Same is true with peace. We have a choice of turning our vast technological weaponry into plowshares. However, given Mormons' penchant to be a warlike people, as President Kimball characterizes, such a peaceful future seems like a fanciful dream. Another way in which technology can have a negative effect is distracting us from important matters by dominating our attention and occupying our affections. In an article in the June 2010 Ensign titled Things As They Really Are, Elder Bednar address the negative impact of media on relationships. Sadly, some young men and young women in the church today neglect eternal relationships for digital distractions, diversions, and detours that have no lasting value. My heart aches when a young couple experience marital difficulty because of the, ex the excessive uh, addicting effect of excessive video gaming or online socializing. And I think that that is a uh, clearly uh, a danger that is affecting uh, our, our, our families. I'm not suggesting all technology is bad, he said, but it is, it is not. Nor am I saying we should not use as many capabilities to communicate to lift and brighten lives. But I'm raising a warning, a warning voice. Elder Bednar seems to be giving a warning voice a lot these days, um, uh, which I think in this case is certainly uh, well-deserved. Uh, one of the problems with our constant obsession with social media and electronic devices is that they lead to what Linda Stone calls continuous partial attention. It's a wonderful term, continuous partial attention, which means that we're not paying full attention to anyone, to ourselves, to God, or to others. When the transatlantic cable was finally finished in the middle of the 19th century, Henry David Thoreau observed, with our hundred, quote, modern improvements, there is an illusion about them there's not always a positive advance. The devil goes on exacting compound interest to the last for his share and numerous succeeding investments in them. 
Our inventions are wont to be petty toys. We are in great haste, he said, to construct a magnetic telegraph from Maine to Texas. But Maine and Texas, it may, may, it may be, have nothing important to communicate. As if the objective were to walk fast and not to talk, were to talk fast and not to talk sensibly. We are eager to tunnel under the Atlantic and bring the old world some weeks closer to the new. But perchance the first news that will leak through the broad, flapping American ear will be that the Princess Adelaide has the whooping cough. After all, the man whose horse trots a mile a minute does not carry the most important messages. He is not an evangelist, nor does he come, nor does he come around eating locusts and wild honey. As Thoreau said, these are improved means to an unimproved end. Well, there are many other such devices that we all are, uh, are aware of. Um, one of those it seems to me that we should have some concern about is the extent to which modern technology allows for the surveillance of private and personal communications. According to Lewis Lapham, since 1911, the apparatus to gather intelligence on American citizens has grown to include more than 3,000 government and private agencies involved in intelligence gathering at 17,000 locations across the United States. And there is a huge national database that facilitates mass surveillance in the United States. According to the ACLU, the Patriot, the Patriot Act passed in 19, uh, in, uh, right after 9-11 uh, allows the government to monitor phone, email communications, collect bank and credit re reporting records, and track the activity of innocent Americans on the internet. There is no evidence that the church employs technology to keep track of private, the private lives of members. But given its response to criticism and the example of governments and corporations, it is possible that in the, in the future it might be tempted to do so. As Brett Jackson observes, quote, no church in the world knows more about how their members are doing and where they are than the LDS church. With the home teaching program, the leaders of each local congregation have an insight into each member's status and needs. Enter the LDS church leaders secure resources about members utilizing the internet. Leaders have access to non-sensitive data, hopefully not sensitive, about each member wherever, whenever they need it. In addition, leaders have instant access via web or device to any other leader's information in the world if they need to contact them. The ironically named Strengthening Church Members Community, established under the direction of President Ezra Taft Benson, who had a penchant for suspecting conspiracy in high and low places, suggests a possible use of technology to collect information on critics and suspected apostates of the church. According to church spokesman Don Lefebvre, the committee, quote, receives complaints from church members about other members who have made statements that conceivably could do harm to the church and passes those on to local uh, leaders. It says it uh, makes no judgment on such communication but leaves us up to the discretion of, in, of local leaders. Based on my experience, and I do have a file, the Church Strength and Church Members Committee, and it's been there for some years, and this may be going into it, who knows. Um, based on my experience, it is a rare leader who upon receiving such a communica communication from the Strengthening Members Committee, which is headed by two members of the Quorum of the Twelve, chooses not to act. When the church feels threatened from within or without, history shows that such threats can cause not only a de not only defensive, but a punitive reaction. As I say, there is no evidence that the church uses or plans on using technology for such purposes, but the fact that the Strengthening Members Committee was secret until inadvertently relieved, revealed in 1991 gives one pause. Given where we are in the history of the world, it is impossible to conceive of a world without technology or without new technological inventions. Drones that carry nuclear weapons, uh, weapons, machines that think, automobiles that drive themselves, medical advances that significantly extend life, brain-to-brain -brain communication, time travel, who knows what the future holds. What we do know is that if we use technology intelligently and righteously, it can be a blessing. If we don't, it certainly will be a curse. As B.F. Skinner said, the real problem is not whether machines think, but whether men and women do. And we could add, the real problem isn't whether 
we can construct machines that feel, but whether we can continue to feel. We can't make it back to the garden or into the future without listening to our own and to one another's hearts. No technology is a substitute for that. No electronic media are capable of empathy and compassion, at least not yet. No technology produces holiness. No machines are capable of giving and accepting love. Machines may be able to approximate some of the functions of the human brain, but only gods and humans have hearts capable of deep and enduring love. Thus, when we stand before the keeper of the gate, the Holy One of Israel, he will not, he will not ask how many tweets we send a day, how quickly we can find something on the internet, or how many friends we have on Facebook. Rather, like the Egyptians, he will weigh our hearts. Thank you. We now have time for questions. OK. Judy. I agree. I wonder what else I've agreed to. <laughs> so uh, the, the statement was, for this recording, is that on the, the scripture, the app that you download, uh, uh, apparently there is a statement there that indicates that uh, the church wants to know how many times you read first, third Nephi as opposed to how many times you read first Nephi over and over and over again. Um, Does that only track what you do on LPS I don't know what technology is available to keep track of all of the things that we search on the internet. Uh, it certainly makes a lot of people nervous to they think that anybody track. would be tracking. They uh, can't track your usage of other websites, only the things you do on LPS. It's just, it's just on the website. Okay, so everybody's safe. We hope for the minute. Yes, ma'am. She asked a very good question. I am on the national board of a group called No Bully, and we deal with bullying in the schools. And uh, uh, cyberbullying is one of the really big problems uh, on the internet and in our society. It has led to suicides, it is a, just a, a terrible problem. I don't know about cyberbullying within the Mormon uh, blogosphere, but given the vitriolic communications that go on between Mormons and anti-Mormons, between pro and con, between all of the, uh, uh, the what one might expect, certainly there is a lot of uh, nastiness on the, uh, on the website and it's on both sides uh, of people excommunicating one another electronically. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so I, I, I don't know, I, what I do know from my work with uh, uh, the No Bully uh, Foundation is that it is a common problem and it's a huge problem because p people can be anonymous and can use that anonymity to bully uh, other people. There is a kind of you know, implied thing. I was reading this morning, uh, not this morning, I got up too early to do that. I was reading last night that um, I was reading uh, comments on uh, uh, Elder Bednar's address to the students at BYU Idaho. And, uh, and, or maybe it was the one about the church's policy. Uh, and people were, were taking, uh, you know, it's very, there, there's very little middle ground in Mormonism these days. You know, people run to uh, the uh, one pole or the other and then cast stones and verbal abuses across this widening gap. But there were some things that, that 
that basically said anybody who doesn't accept uh, this new policy, which was a subject of a uh, panel that will be this afternoon, uh, is not following God, is not righteous, doesn't uh, support the brethren, whatever. There is a tendency, and that happens on both sides, each side calling the other side idiots and whatever else. So there is, if there isn't direct bullying of a person, there certainly is a disrespect and a trashing of anyone who doesn't agree with the, the, the person's uh, passion. But I would guess that there is bullying, uh, but since I am, you know, it probably wouldn't surprise you that I was on Facebook for a day years ago, but, <laughs> and I even understand I got hundreds of friends there, but I don't know. Uh, anyway, it's a very good question, the time again. Yes? statement was about all of these technological innovations uh, that uh, many of them are using basically radio waves uh, to do uh, to communicate but the fact of the matter is is that uh, do we can do so many things better and faster than we could uh, even a few years ago I mean the, if you look at the, the line of technological developments over uh, human history it goes like this and then it goes like this we're still going into the stratosphere. Um, the question is, are these improved means to improved ends or improved means to unimproved ends or unimproved means to unimproved ends? And this comes back to what I was saying, is that whatever, Jesus didn't use technology to preach the gospel, and yet he was the most powerful teacher in all of history. Am I grateful that I can carry the scriptures in my, on my cell phone instead of that big quad? Yeah. Do I read it the same as I did before? That's a question. Do we read it? Do we live by it? How is it affecting, how is technology affecting our lives? And I think this to me would be the challenge of any church or organization. Uh, if you can keep track of people, I mean certainly missionaries using the iPad to teach I think is a, is a helpful innovation. Uh, if in fact the message is a good message, and if the messenger is giving that in a loving way. Uh, so we can be in love with technology, we can be enslaved to technology, technology can govern and ruin our lives, and I think there isn't enough emphasis on the way in which we can constructively use technology. But in a way, technology is neutral. Technology is what is cars, are great convenience. Cars can be used to kill. No, no technology without a human being doing something with it, at least at this point, with robots, I have no idea what's going to happen. But, uh, but it, is, it is a moral question. Uh, that's a question I'll be talking about a little bit in the, the afternoon the session on, uh, uh, on imagining. And there I'm asking us to imagine what kind of technology there's going to be 20, 30 years from now. If you could right now do that, and part of what I'm saying, which uh, it makes your point, is almost impossible. If you go back 30 years, and I was born in the 30s, so it tells you how old I am. Uh, who, 
I couldn't have conceived of the world I live in and take for granted today. Can we conceive of the world 25, 30, or 50 years from now uh, and what it will be like? Will we look back on this the same way we look back on the pioneers and are, are we as incapable of looking forward as they were of seeing our day? Yes. So your, the point that you made is that like Jesus didn't use technology. But like one of Clark's three laws was that any any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from nature. And like we do have the miracles of Jesus, right? Turning water to wine, raising the dead, like all of those we go back and further. Not, not catching on YouTube. Well, but 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 maybe with people that were actually there, right? And so like you could even like come up with like Moses party in the Red Sea. Like, these are, this is maybe, maybe technology isn't the right word, but like that was in use, like that idea, like we don't call it technology then, like maybe we could call it, I hate to say magic because that makes it sound bad. But, you know, like, isn't that part of the same thing? It's a very good point. And th in fact, this afternoon I'm going to be talking about what we call human technology. And human technology is the use of spiritual. Uh, emotional, uh, intellectual tools. It is, you know, love, compassion, empathy. The, this is human technology, and it is the combination of human technology with electronic or mechanical or other kinds of technology that makes the difference. So yes, and it may be that uh, we will have access. In fact, it's one of the things that I, you know, the, the ability to access the quantum world could absolutely be uh, a, an astonishing uh, revolution. And there are people who believe that we are on the verge of being able, we already can access that, that a scientist can. How can that become something that we do? That may be an astonishing technological revolution. Uh, and so, uh, yes, uh, those things that we are capable of that machines aren't, at least yet, all of them, and some of them I think machines never will be, should be part of our discussion about technology. Thank you. Um, Bob? Yes. Just to tack on to what he's saying, I would argue that um, if it's being accomplished, uh, it, basically that God himself uh, does not disobey the laws of physics, right? So if any miracle is being accomplished, it's being accomplished through some means that we don't yet understand, but that is ultimately technological in nature. Yeah, and that's, that's the definition of a miracle is a, something that happens according to laws we don't understand. Thankfully, I think we can say God understands physics post-Einstein rather than pre-Einstein. Uh, and who knows what's going to be post whatever we are, the laws of physics that God understands for to be able to make a command and have something come into being. Uh, yes, we are still... Uh, we, we see ourselves as living in a highly advanced and enlightened age. We will be looked back on uh, in people in the future to say, my gosh, they were, they were doing what with, you know, and look at our medical technology, how far we've advanced, and yet there's so many things that we don't know. We don't know how to solve a lot of medical problems today, but we know how to solve more than we did a decade ago. I have two grandchildren who are alive because of neonatal uh, 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 research as a medical science that saved their lives when they were born one at two and a half pounds. There's now a beautiful 15-year-old kid doing beautifully bright things. So I am very grateful to live in such a technologically advanced age, but I think we also have to look at the dark side of technology. We have drones that are killing thousands of innocent people around the world, or in certain parts of the world. Our Weaponry is destroying lives and civilizations. Uh, our technology uh, is often used to nefarious and evil ends. We have to be responsible for that. And how we be responsible, I think, is going back to having this dialogue between our heads and our hearts and between our, our souls and whatever exists out there in the world we inhabit. Any other question? Yes, question back here. Um, so your discussion of like, information technology particularly seemed like you highlighted two major threats in that as individuals, digital intimacies can rob us of connection with God and with others. And on the other side, you highlighted the dangers of our church misusing information technologies to violate trust or to enter into our lives because we're not prepared for it to be. 
if, if they are doing that. Right? If they're doing that. Yeah. And, uh, um, you highlighted you know, uh, the webinar's comments that address the personal. Are there any resources or thoughts towards what there can be to prevent these larger abuses, the abuses of government, the abuses of organizations, focusing too much on individual lives? Uh, I, uh, thank you, Chase. Um, Chase is working on a PhD uh, uh, here at uh, UC Berkeley. And I mentioned to him a new, the newest issue of the Lapham Quarterly. I don't know if you know this journal, L-A-P-H-A-M, started by Lewis Lapham, the former editor of Harper's uh, Magazine. Uh, anyway, his, his newest issue, which just came this week, is on spying and the use of technology by governments and uh, groups and individuals uh, to, uh, uh, to gather information uh, almost always uh, for ends uh, uh, that, uh, that turn out not to be as they are promised. Uh, there is a lot of research done on that, but it, because so much of the surveillance is secret and unknown, it is difficult sometimes to have reliable research, but there is research on that. And I, again, I, I only know about the strengthening the members committee and don't know other than you know, whether that's still, I assume that since, you know, when I first found out 40 years ago that there was a file on me, which I was surprised, naive as I was, uh, that such a file existed on me. Uh, that was before the internet. And I assume that uh, you know, some, some member of my ward who thought my gospel doctrine class was a little edgy uh, wrote a letter to some apostle or whatever. Uh, uh, or, but now that we have the internet, it's so much easier. So my, my file is probably not grown fatter, but deeper electronically than it was before. But I have no idea. I, I really don't know. I just know that, uh, uh, that my state president uh, reported to me when I asked him, do you think there's a file? And he said, let me find out. And he said, yeah, there is one. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so I belong to some kind of a special fellowship. <laughs> and all of you may be a part of it. <laughs> Since you showed up here, and you registered online, and who knows what. Yes. in our statement of the technology of the day being part of hastening the work. Because it seems to me, from my observation, um, current uh, information technology has been disruptive to the church, uh, maybe more disruptive than useful. So I, I wanted to talk about that. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think the church is clearly facing this, um, uh, whether or not the internet there's no question that the internet has been a terribly disruptive uh, technology for the church. Um, the church controlled its message uh, before the internet, pretty much. Uh, that is, few, few people could dig deep into the journal of discourses or read all of the, the articles. They, you couldn't Google whatever. And even though the church does influence, as, this, as Brett Jackson said, there is a way to influence what comes up first on Google. Uh, and the church is clearly strategically uh, controlling that because there are a lot of anti-Mormon groups that try and do that. As I think some of you know that the, uh, uh, on the Wikipedia, there is an underground battle going on on Wikipedia between the evangelicals and the anti-Mormons and the Mormons for the narrative about Joseph Smith because you can change things on Wikipedia. So if you think somebody's done too polished a job, you can come in and and affect that. Uh, so the, there's no question that the genie is out of the bottle, uh, what do you want to call it, however you look at that genie, and we are now in a world in which I think the church is, um, I think the church is not simply aware but very wary of the potential uses of this technology and uh, when instantaneously things that might have been spoken within a small group can now be broadcast across the world. And, uh, and there is a certain positive aspect of that, which is the gospel message can be uh, broadcast to the world, but also a negative uh, 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 message can be broadcast. So I think the church is highly aware of it. I, I think if you will be talking about this in the panel uh, session this afternoon, on the church's change in policy. 
um, you know, how quickly that was leaked, how quickly there was seemed to be damage control, how quickly that damage control was attempted to be tamped down with Elder Nelson's uh, um, uh, address. Uh, but we're not going to put that one back in the bottle very quickly or easily, or maybe ever. One more question, yes. Well, what, what do you think has driven the church's embrace of technology more? Is it the desire to spread the gospel message or the desire to correlate the gospel amongst its members? Good question. Is the church's interest in technology more to spread the gospel or to correlate its message? I'm, I tend to be more optimistic and I'm a very trusting person, which has gotten me into trouble. Uh, but I think the essential impulse of the church is to fulfill its fourfold mission through any means possible. Uh, and so I think it's, also, it's the uh, initial use of the telegraph and the telephone and radio and television uh, was to get that message out. That was before correlation, much of it. Post-correlation, I think it's both. Part of it is to control the message. Part of it is to get it out. I think there is a certain, I'm sure within church leadership there is a struggle between those two things, and uh, and and you know how that comes out, I think we will just have to go home and Google tonight to find out. <laughs> Thank you all very much.